Welcome to the Regen Ag SA podcast, the podcast where we chat to people who are making a difference in moving agriculture in a direction that understands that soil has a whole lot more to do than just be a medium for growing our food. People who understand the full ecosystem function of soil, people who understand that change is required to on-farm practices to improve soil health and ultimately soil function. These people come in many forms. They are farmers, consultants, researchers, scientists, academics, financial people, food makers, and retailers. And all are required for this change to take place. We call them regenerators. It is critical that we start regenerating across the whole food supply chain. But it all starts with the soil. Regenerative agriculture starts with the regeneration of the soil plant ecosystem, the relationship between plants and soil microbiology. My name is Andrew Ardington, and I'm the host of the podcast. Regen Ag SA is privileged to work with these pioneers. Regeneration is the future of agriculture, and we need to be hearing what the people who are making these changes have to say. For decades, soil has been considered merely a medium for holding plants, while plant nutrition and plant health have been provided for with bought-in chemicals. The soil as a medium model of food production is economically unsustainable at farm level. It is also environmentally unsustainable. I'm looking forward to learning how we can change to a regenerative system from these regenerators. Okay, today in our third episode, Gavin Olson is back for more, and we're going to chat about soil, soil structure, soil microbiology, and soil tests, both the traditional chemical ones and the newer biological ones. Ever since the invention of synthetic fertilizer, the biological fraction of soil has been neglected, with our focus having honed in on the physical and chemical fractions. We now realize the multiple problems associated with leaving out the biological fraction. Additionally, many of our standard farming practices damage soil structure, soil organic matter content, water infiltration capacity, water holding capacity, soil microbiology, soil fertility, and of course, soil ecosystem resilience. I have personally on farms seen how rapidly things can improve when farming practices change, how windy days are no longer dusty days, how water starts to infiltrate rather than pool and run off. I have, however, also seen how soils improve and then get stuck. At times, this is difficult for farmers. It's difficult for them not to reach back into their old toolbox for their previous farming practices to fix the problems they now encounter. Gavin, I'm sure you've seen many of these problems. Welcome back. And I look forward Thanks. to learning more about soils from you and what we need to take into account in terms of soil management as we transition soils from industrial systems to more natural ones. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, it's uh, it's true. We owe, uh, you probably heard the story, we owe most of civilization to the, the six inches that we stand on every day uh, of the soil that we, you know, we, we've we've produced all of our food out of those top six inches. So it is um, it is true that through progression of technology, we've uh, we've maybe got excited about new discoveries and then forgotten some basics. And then I think um, in retrospect, uh, listening to the, the the wise old farmers uh, has now come back and uh, and listening to some of the, the 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 good science out there as well. You know, the marriage of the two, I think, is is where we're progressing towards. And um, I'm super excited because we we see different uh, parts of the world. Everyone's doing their bits down in Australia, you know, yeah, us in SA, in Southern Africa, Central Africa, uh, you know, and in the Americas as well. The people are really trying their best to to improve soil. And um, and and certainly, as you as you alluded to in your opening statement, there the um, the biological component was ignored for many years, um, purely because of its compl complexity. I think. Uh, it's it's something that we um we didn't find easy to analyze so we sort of just you know we pushed it under the carpet for now and we focused on the things that we could test and analyze um 
and and that's uh, and that we now have the tools uh, as as a parent, and we're learning more and more each day. It's it's quite quite amazing. Yeah, I mean, uh, biology and carbon didn't make it into the soil science classes I did when I was at university, and uh, and now they're moving to take you know, a high profile stage. It, it's it's interesting that that's now become the cutting edge of technology and scientific research in terms of agricultural production. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I remember when I attended university, I, I, um, I, uh, we all stood uh, the first six months with uh, chemistry 164, was uh, inorganic chemistry, you know, the basics. And that was a six month course. And then after that, uh, you uh, you would do organic chemistry, and that you would keep doing for the rest of your university life. And and the reason being is, as soon as you add carbon to any equation, the permutations become infinitum. They you know they they're endless the the the, pers the possibility. So when you're trying to solve a a nutrition problem in the soil, you know sometimes it's just so complex that tossing the carbon aside and only focusing on the mineralogy is 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 easy, really. Um, and and I think that's why it was so easy for us as as scientists to be able to accelerate a method to analyze the availability or the content or the um, you know the total available pool of of available nutrients and then and then based on what plants uh, demand is saying well if I have a hundred kilograms in my soil and my plant needs fifty well I've got two years worth of, of of crop in my soil I need to only replace fifty this year and I'll I'll have maintain a a, um, I'll maintain some sort of, uh, of 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 level in the soil, and and that's been the status quo for I think probably up until about the last twenty years, uh, fifteen years really, um, where we've started to look at at many other aspects um, other than the the chemical and the soils consists of of a chemical, physical, and a, and a biological component, and the three have a, a strong influence on each other. I mean, you will not have biology if your soil isn't um, uh, physically, uh, with uh, uh, you know, good, good good pore structure and allowing uh, water ingress, allowing oxygen to be uh, brought into the soil. The deeper you can have that happening, the deeper you're going to have biological activity in your soil. Um, and then, the, and then, of obviously, the the nutrition, the, the the physical elements in the soil have to be absorbed by all of these organisms um, to become bioavailable. Some of them, like nitrogen, is a is, is a biological cycle, a nitrogen cycle. We have a phosphorus cycle, which has got a biological component. We have the carbon cycle, the water cycle, the sulfur cycle. So um, all of those uh, components, those basic ones of, of phosphorus, carbon, nitrogen, uh, um, and sulfur, give us the ability to 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 give us the primordial soup on which we can build most amino acids, which which are, are what we then find, um, you know, probably all of the living things on the planet that are biological or organic have those components in them. So, so that whole, um, that whole measurement around those cycles and the, the flux and change in the soil was just too complex for us. So we just focused on the mineralogy and, and it did work. I mean, we produced more and more food, but our soils were healthy then. Yeah. You know, we, we still know of, of, of recordings of, of farmers when they first worked with enriched uh, phosphate citric acid solubilized phosphate and they applied that to soils and uh, the results the farmers got were astounding. I mean, huge maize crops, et cetera, with average genetics in those years, they produced bumper crops. But over the years, we needed to apply more and more of it because the soil just got worn out. And, and the reason it got worn out was the mechanized uh, moving of the soil and turning it upside down and and loss of, of biology. And we, we um, we admittedly didn't have the tools then, and I don't think we were so excited about their yield increase and being able to sell more food <laughs> that we we didn't realize what we were up to. So, yeah, it's it's amazing if you think about all those cycles and and how important they are to our existence, not just our existence, many other creatures' existence on the planet, and uh, so many of them actually process through the plant soil ecosystem and yet we have done such an astounding job of of weakening that ecosystem um, yes yeah. with our agriculture but you know before we get too depressed the uh for me the really exciting thing is is how quickly you can see that turn around once people start to change the practices 
um, and start to focus on soil health, how, how quickly, just in a couple of years, things start to change right before your eyes. Andrew, it's um, it's imperative that, you know, if, if, if a farmer has realized he's, he's putting more fertilizer down and he keeps seeing a recurrence of, of, of a pest influx uh, of more nematode issues, he sees all kinds of things. This is a, obviously a, a commercial um, grower who's, He's trying to produce a good yield. Um, he he sees that his his challenges are just becoming more and more. Nine times out of ten, our experience tells us the biology is 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 the resilience has gone from that ecosystem, and we need to bring it back. So I mean, my two colleagues I, I work with, Philip and Hanu, in the serious area, they they had one grower now where we just put some, you know, we've got like a soil boost, uh, soil remediation sort of strategy where we we open and flocculate the soil. And we and we boost it with with biology and with like fish hydrolysate and some uh, humic acids and things like that. And um, oh, it was I can show you video clips. Maybe we can post them on on, on region ag. Yes, uh, the comments are in Afrikaans, but uh, it's a it's a question of of thirty days where we we couldn't get uh, uh, um, a geology hammer into the top layer easily, and uh, thirty days later it was very soft and well mulched and. Um, and we had earthworms. Uh, they decided to come back up from the depths of the bowels of the earth because it was now there was some biology at the top that they were interested in. Uh, it, it is possible to remediate soils, and in this instance, this commercial grower needs to needs to be able to do it rapidly because there's this very expensive crop standing on it. So it warrants the effort. But I mean, if you if you have an animal factor, and and this is what we've learned from our organic and 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 also uh, even from uh, biodynamic farmers. Um, where the first thing was looking at, at obviously restoring the soil health by bringing manures and compost in, you know, with cover cropping uh, and with uh, the riser deposition of carbon from all of your your non leguminous plants uh, and then your legumes bringing nitrogen to the soil, with the available pool of phosphorus in the soil uh, also needs to be brought alive by the microbes because they need it just as we do. We all need this energy molecule called adenosine adenosine phosphate which is our phosphate energy carrier in, in all biological processes, whether it's a bacteria, a fungi, a human, uh, or an animal, it's all the same uh, molecule. And, and so there's a great desire to solubilize and get a hold of this phosphorus. So once you really start generating uh, microbial activity, you, the fact is you, you bring the source to life, but you can't do it without these two minerals of carbon and and nitrogen, uh, and so so it's a bit of a catch twenty two situation. But the microbes tend to um, stabilize the environment to what they want, and the soil starts to remediate itself. You, you just see a, a huge recovery when you have diversity, where you're using a cover crop for argument's sake in an orchard or a vineyard, or even on a broad acre farming setup where they're doing rotations. I just visited uh, some farms in the center of the country now. Um, there's a well known uh, Fanikak gentleman near on the on the Fana Cliff Dam. Area and I mean he's, he's he's harvesting seven tons of soyas on a on a rotation system where they've had no at all for twenty years or ten years I stand in correction ten or twenty years and um you know the the, the soy yield is incredible mm -hmm. and and when you go in deep you 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 look down you can see the organic horizon has migrated down and that's because there's permanently roots in the soil um and that that gives the the soil and it maintains the biology so you just build on it every year unfortunately if you had to run a plow through that turn it over you reset it and you set it back you know x amount and and every time you do that you set it back again and set it back again so very often you know you you, you find why no till or minimum till or strip till uh produces such rapid results uh and, and a lot of the nutrients just become available so we've um, we've remediated soils uh, where we've applied just some biology, just microbes, like 20 liters of microbes, a uh, proprietary blend that we make. And we apply that to the soil and we come back a year later. And without applying too much phosphate, we've gone like from, say, 40 parts per million of phosphorus to 120 parts. Of, so that equates to, you know, th three, a threefold increase of available phosphorus in the soil. And that was there already. It just wasn't available because the biology was not stimulated. So... Again, this this whole interlink of the physical, chemical, and the biological aspect is is so important for farmers to to be able to be productive. Um, and and what I mean by that is is the inputs are reduced eventually because as you get more nutrients available in the soil, 
the farmer doing his, uh, the agronomist doing their calculation deduces that we'll need to apply less. So obviously big fertilizer companies don't want to hear that because um, they have a machine applying fertilizer, producing it. So I've, I've seen fertilizer reductions on some form of zero for the first three years because the soils are so degraded and others where we can cut the nitrogen 50% within the first year. Oh. I mean, above each hectare, there's loads of nitrogen. So it, it just needs to be connected to the soil with some legumes. And that's the that's the role of of diversity and cover cropping. Um and, and a good your animal factor, Andrew. I mean, um I'd love to know a study of which animals manure is the best one. Uh, but I mean, I suppose if we could have fowls and cattle and sheep grazing, you know, we've got cattle that can graze long grass, sheep that are grasses, and we've got rotifiers or things like poultry in there, you'd probably find the blend would give you a, a you know biological bomb of note. If if we could have both both plant and animal diversity, then 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 that would be best. Yeah, the different animals just their their different mechanisms of breaking their their food down and their dung. You know whether it's a cow with a much more liquid, you know, much higher moisture content inside the dung, creating an environment for microbiology to move from the soil up into it. When you're using monogastrics, you you're kind of fertilizing because you're bringing in some feed for them. Yeah, the chickens are eating some grain and th and then they're pooping that grain onto the onto the field. So it's right. it's uh, it's even it's it's diversity plus a little bit extra. Jumping back a bit in the story, if we go back to to soil that's broken in its structure, um, the aggregate has collapsed, uh, the organic fraction is 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 way down low. Uh, in many cases, as much as seventy five percent lost through the farming over the years. Could you just do like a route of things that you need to look at there? Just tell tell people uh, a, a story of you know looking at a soil and, and go like, what do we need to do here? What do we need to check? What do we need to test so that we can start this road to recovery? So when we started look, looking at, 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 I mean, if, if I just went and I, I often say, if you go and look at really who the, the groundbreakers in this, was the environmentalists, the small-scale farmers, the, the organic guys, the composters, the, the guys who were looking at, at at recycling nutrients back in the soil. And the thing for them was is that they just knew that it worked. They didn't know why. I say that with, with reservation. I do believe that there are many people out there uh, that do know how it works. But that they, they, they didn't quantify it in, in such a way that we could say, well, X amount of this. Because... As I said earlier, organics brings in a large amount of variation and permutation. So using composted material from X won't give you a result, but maybe from another source will give you a result. So what we 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 did is we we rested back on, on an area we felt technically comfortable with, and we started with a chemical soil analysis. And, and all we did is we said, well, the chemical soil analysis is just giving us a reflection of, of the reserve in the soil. The extraction medium that's used in the laboratory extracts at much lower um, acidities than, than what plants normally experience. So it's a skewed picture, but it does give you of the total reserve. Um, and that that is the uh, um, uh, at least the, the basis from which we work. What we have realized over time is that sometimes we have to over fertilize to achieve it because the soil is binding up the nutrients. So so we rested on the fact that if if we looked at the amount of nutrients in the soil, the amount of nutrient the soil can hold is only driven by two factors. The one is the clay content, and, and we don't want to go too far into the types of clay, but you get five different types of clays, and, and that's um, chemically some have uh, incredible qualities of complexing huge amounts of water and, um, and nutrients on them, and others less so. And their attractive forces are stronger and some are slightly weaker, but they're clays. Um, and then the other factor is organic matter, because both of them are inherently negatively charged. So they will attract anything that's positively charged. And uh, so for us, we said, well, if a soil has very little nutrients in it, we're going to put it right at the top of the list, and then we're going to filter all the way the data down to a soil that has the most nutrients in it. And that inevitably tells us the soil's uh, what we call the cation exchange, how many positives it can hold. It's like a battery's charge. So a battery might be 12 volts, but it's amp hours determines the amount of energy it can put out. Mm. So you have a 48 amp hour and 96 amp hour. So the one could start a car and the one could start a tractor. So that, that you know, that, that, that's really what we're looking at. So without getting too fancy in the, dis, in the discussion, 
you um, you then classify each of those bands. And what we do is we take bands of 0 to 10 and we say, well, these are normally generally sandy soils with low low nutrient holding capacity. Then we look at the medium range soils and then look at the higher soils. And then within those, we we find reference blocks statistically based on the number of, of, of areas that have been sampled. And then we take a reference point and we go back to it. And then we, we measure and we do various types of soil tests there. And those newer tests not only cover a part of the chemical analysis that we've already used to, it will also in, incorporate looking at all of the microbially active carbon. Um, we look at um, uh, the respiration rate of the organisms in the soil. Then we look at uh, the, the amount of, of organic nitrogen that's going to be released. We look at the availability of uh, organic, inorganic phosphorus. We look at the availability of, of things like potassium in the soil. So we, we start to find out more about the availability with this other type of test we do. Um, and then every other year, what we can do is, is we, we will analyze then only on one or two of those selected sites. We will do a further test. And at this stage, the most effective one we use is, is what we call a phospholipid fatty acid test. So we essentially solubilize all the living components in the soil. All cells of all living organisms have a calcium phosphorus, uh, it's called a phospholipid membrane. And so what we do is we solubilize that out. It's basically like a taxidermy exercise. We're only pulling out the skin and uh, we're having a look at what types of skins are in the soil. And that's giving us a profile of what we call these trophic levels. So that starts to tell us the biological pyramid that that farmer has in his soil. Now, his farming practice can affect that, um, that pyramid drastically. And what you don't want to do is erode the bottom of your pyramid. You might still have a pyramid in your soil. If your soil is uh, very sterile, you'll still have a pyramid there, but it'll be just a very small pyramid. And the idea is, is to get a very wide base. You want a lot of biological activity. And all of this biological activity starts where um, we have a deposition of carbon in the soil. And the biggest depositor of carbon in the soil is plants with um, them exuding uh, carbohydrates at their roots, uh, their, their connection with beneficial fungi like mycorrhiza that have the ability to rise deposit volumes, large volumes of carbon dioxide or carbon in the soil, sorry, through the form of, of, of unique sugars. So, so this combination of plant interaction with the um, with the microbes in the soil and fixing all of this carbon starts to build the soil. And as we build the soil with the plants, it starts to uh, improve the, um, the biological activity. So it is a process where cover cropping and other plants and diversity make a, you know, you don't want to walk into an orchard and see only five types or three types of grasses and, and two broadleaves and then your vineyard standing there for argument's sake or your apple tree. It, it just, you have low diversity. So you want to bring more diversity in there. Um, there's a farmer up in KZN, Pete Nicholson. I think you might know him. Yeah. Uh, Pete's a Kiwi farmer. He's a flipping good farmer. He's a hell of a nice chap as well, but he, He's, he amazed me because I've, I've been to his farm and I looked at his soil analysis. And I mean, he, he analyzes on a soil analysis three parts per million of phosphorus in the soil. It's like every agronomist in the world will go and find a bag of superphosphate and throw it down. But he's planting these multi-species cover crop mixtures. And because he's got this growing biomass that's always decomposing in his orchard, he's always got this large pool of available organic phosphorus. And... Um, his leaves never analyze any phosphorus deficiency, although we can't find any chemically in the soil because it's all in the biological pool of, of peas. So now the, there's cycles like that. And then we've gone to Namibia where we work with table grape farmers and very dry arid soils in Ozenkir. And the soil tests 180, 200, 300 parts per million of phosphorus. But when you look for availability, there's nothing. Though you can't find any available because of the pH, et cetera. And there we added uh, biology and we added microbes. And within, you know, within two, three months, we had high levels of available phosphorus. So organisms are just incredible uh, in, in stabilizing an environment immediately to look after themselves. They want to, so they're almost like have soldiers that go to the outside of the, of the reaction circle and say, right, let's defend this area and, and stabilize it so that we all can live and cohesively. And, um, and in that process, we've discovered there's helper bacteria, there's, there's one bug that does this, the other bug does that. And then there's organisms that eat those bugs. And when they die, they release fertilizer back to the soil. So it's it's important that we do that test and we look at those trophic levels um, over time. And, and then we can start helping a farmer 
drive, especially a large commercial farmer, drive his, uh, his, his farming practice in a direction that improves his soil, not only biologically, but chemically, and inherently all of the physical qualities will fall in place there. So thinking back to, you know, I often hear this term, you know, getting your soil balanced before you start. And, you know, back to von Liebig's law of minimum, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things, the calcium magnesium ratio, get that right, et cetera, et cetera. Can you just go into the the, the significance of getting your your chemical physical right to be able to enable your biological? Is there kind of a law of minimum there also? Like that's not going to happen unless the others happen. So in, interestingly, do you know that Libich was responsible for for uh, producing or manufacturing Freibentos, which is now known as Marmite or Bovril? That's his actual claim to fame. Yeah, <laughs> so he's a really good guy. I like I love Marmite. <laughs> sure. Andrew, you know, uh, balancing the soil, we we. I mean, we've all read about Dr. William Albrecht and, and, and the work that he did and, and obviously um, his exclusion from research circles after he, he obviously purported what he believed to be the truth and and it opposed uh, a, a lot of the, the mainstream funding at universities around the US. So he was he was sort of blocked, but he, a lot of his research work later came to, 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 to bear and we for a long time have been eyeballed as, as, as being pseudoscientists because we believe in it. But I have yet to find a scenario where I need to be disproved that it doesn't work. Um, yes, there's a limit to everything. And if you don't implement certain practice, if you implement certain practices and you don't include others, then you are running a risk of, of, of pushing a soil in, in the wrong direction. So th there's certain rules. You know, if you're going to go and play rugby, you, you've got to put a, a head guard on and, and wear a gum guard. Otherwise, your chance of getting a concussion are pretty good. So this is one of the scenarios where if we look at the structure of soil, and that's on a soil analysis, one of the first things we do is besides categorizing and how and where we want to do our biological test, when we look at the chemical analysis, the first thing we obviously look at is the pH of the soil. It merely indicates to me the concentration of acidity or no acidity, alkalinity or acidity. And we know from chemistry that the more acid a soil is, the more solubilized and available certain metals are. Metals only dissolve in acid. Um, and then obviously some other metals uh, um, uh, tend to only become more available at a, at a higher pH. And then when that happens, um, they interact with, with other nutrients. But that's only telling us the chemical interaction. What's important to realize is well, why on a soil analysis, and if anyone does one, I think there's a lot of growers out there that spend lots of money on analyses and they, they're worth every cent of it, uh, is that you'll find that they always test for sodium. They test for the hydrogen ions, which is the acidity, the sodium, the potash, the potassium, the magnesium, and the calcium content. And the reason being, and aluminium as well, uh, is those elements are found in the most uh, abundantly in, in, in soil. So they make up a large volume of it. All of the others, as we call the secondary nutrients and the micronutrients, cons constitute a much smaller amount. Mm. But the reason that calcium and magnesium became so important to Dr. Albrecht and the likes of is they started to ameliorate it on soils because they wanted animals to have better bone structure and they wanted milk to have high calcium content. But with that came um, a soil structure improvement. And, and after many years and, and, and soil scientists researching and looking at it, what, what we've come to realize is the reason that there's this ratio is, as I've described, soils get heavier and they have a more cation exchange, they have more clay or organic matter. What happens to those uh, negatively charged particles is they actually start absorbing these positively charged uh, particles up against their surface. And inherently what happens is then the outside of this entire negatively charged clay colloid or organic fraction is now positively charged. It's not negative anymore. It's saturated. Mm -hmm. And if you have an equivalent particle, the other side of it, and it's saturated, how those positively charged layers, we call it a double diffused layer in the soil, it's now a, a layer that's essentially because two particles were negative. They were still repelling each other, but poorly. Now they're repelling each other strongly because they've, they've got this positive layer. The, the, the distance they push each other away from, and, and these are all laws of gravity uh, that, that are involved still because we're not dealing in the quantum realm. This is normal physics, um, uh, standard physics. So you, you have this law of repulsion. And this repulsive force is driven by the magnetic charge on that soil uh, on that organic fraction now 
calcium and magnesium, which are very dominant in most soils, have two very unique characteristics. The one is calcium is, is, is 1.2, 1.3 times heavier because it has 40 protons and neutrons at its uh, nucleus, and magnesium has 24. Um, so it is it's inherently its, its nucleus is smaller by somewhat, and 99.99% of any atom or ion is constituted by its nucleus. The rest is the space around it. And that space around it is the force that it can exert. And in there rotate all these little electrons. So it now has the ability to, to, to create a repulsive force. The problem that they, we sit with is magnesium is a slightly bigger, uh, bigger area or, or diameter, sorry, uh, versus calcium. It's slightly smaller. And the fact that it's stronger force and it's slightly smaller, um, when you look at the laws of gravitational constant, uh, it's the gravitational constant, the mass of one object minus the mass of the other and the square of the distance between them. So if I narrow the area between two particles and they have a strong attraction, I double the force, fourfold actually. Um, it, it then in, it inevitably beats the forces much, much stronger than, than if it wasn't, if, if they were further apart. Now, if I've got something with a, a a larger diameter and a weaker center, the force that it has in the soil is much, much lower than that of uh, of say for say calcium. So the the flocculating power we call it of the two ions are vastly different. Mm -hmm. So when you find soils with a ratio of calcium and magnesium of where uh, are not uh, at the right sort of ratio, and what Albrecht and Reams and all of the other researchers over the years have discovered is that on a weaker soil, which is now a sandier soil, we need a ratio of more or less three parts calcium to one part magnesium on a milli-equivalent basis, on a chemical basis. On, on, a, um, on a slightly heavier soil, we need five to one. Some places it's four, some places it's six, depends on the given environment. And when the soil is heavier, we need a ratio. So we need more calcium to maintain more soil structure. Yeah. And, and very often you arrive at farms and the magnesium is sky high. It was my problem this whole week just looking at high magnesium soils, inevitably what comes with that is uh, you can see an effect on the oxidation, the reduction on just looking at the mineralogy. You see high levels of manganese and low iron availability. And then you know the soil is not oxidized. It's, it's a reducing soil. So we, we can just from the chemical, our experience tells from the chemical analysis that we have an, an anaerobic soil. So that, that really, that liming uh, uh, aspect now, you cannot do that if you're not working on organic fraction because that lime won't dissolve. If I don't have some biology and I don't have an organic fraction solubilizing carboxylic acids, acids in the soil, uh, the bit of rain that will fall in some areas will have acidity in it. Um, it will it will then solubilize this lime, but the, it takes too long eventually. It takes quite a while. And, and so adding an organic fraction or breaking down crop residues as it releases more acid, we just speed this process up. So you can't lime like that if you're not building organic fraction. And that's the, the dangerous part um, of, uh, of, of trying to widen the ratio of calcium to magnesium uh, or get the ratio correct. And you're not working on the biology. It's, um, you could end up just putting down lots of lime at a great cost to the grower and it lies there unreacted for two, three, four years. And, and it's just a waste of money uh, to the grower. And, and well, you don't get a result because the crop, the, the soil doesn't react on it. And, and the reason we want that structure, Andrew, is to get oxygen in the soil. Oxygen is everything. Um, and we need to we need to open that soil up. And that's where the calcium magnesium helps us do that. And it helps us maintain it for a long, long period. Um, small amounts are extracted by crops, but generally the volume that we put on won't be on a liming, will not be extracted. Or sometimes we use gypsum as well, where the sulfur is low. We will add gypsum uh, as a as a, also as a calcium source. Because um, the 24% gypsum, uh, sulfur in gypsum. We get uh, uh, a lot of positive feedback from people where we've limed for ratios and the soil structure's improved. Once it's improved, that's the biggest tick box we ticked. Um, and then from there on in, it's uh, it's a question of of just getting the, the rest of the nutrients balanced over time. In the, in the introduction, I spoke of, of seeing soils that started to improve and then hitting a, a, a ledge or a glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. In your experience of working with that there, is, is that a, a, a biological problem, a chemical problem, everything once again? Because, you know, I think that often what happens is people start to move to more natural farming systems 
um, yeah. and then they hit a barrier uh, and sadly often go backwards. And so if you could just sort of cast some light on those barriers and, and what things people could do to, to find a way to get through them. So if we look at, at, at mineralogy, I mean, oh, we've been analyzing soils, you know, for their mineral content for 50 plus years now even more than that, 75 years, maybe, eight, eight, even a hundred years, maybe. I, I'm, I don't know. I wasn't around then. Wasn't there. But <laughs> yeah, it, it's been for a long time. And so I would have thought by now with the amount of fertilizer we put down, if we'd had a mineral deficiency, we would have probably picked it up inadvertently through the plant. So we've seen like animals that graze on soils where there's low selenium, the carcass has an issue at, at uh, uh, you know, they find a lot of issues with the um, the animal at slaughter. Uh, if it's a if it's a, a beef farmer, etc., um, they also find certain deficiencies um, that that move through into into plants because the soil has a low level of it. Um, the level that exists in the soil is fine for natural for for, for whatever is would have been growing there naturally, but us as humans, as soon as we intervene and we step into an area and we want to farm it, it's it's no longer a natural environment. It's now managed. We have to regard it as a managed ecosystem. Hmm. And, and so when we start putting more um, uh, demand on the soil, then sure, you, know, you can have a mineral deficiency. But our soil analysis that we've been doing over the years and the amount of unbelievable research that's been done over the years, calculating what we call the withdrawal norms of, uh, you know, we've got so much copper, so much iron, so much zinc, so much manganese is needed for so much ton of, in a ton of wheat. Uh, there's been exhaustive amounts of work done on, on, on volume and said on multiple crops. So, when we look at a source chemistry, we can tell you pretty quickly when you're going to have a deficiency or not. And then the ratios between those. So, so that becomes sometimes of a limiting factor, but really we can address that with inputs. Um, and, and the idea is to, is to say to a farmer, okay, well, your input, your, your uh, let's say potassium for argument's sake, which is when we find a big crisis where magnesium is high, uh, we do suggest to the grower to supplement uh, foliar feeding of potash for a period of time for the first two, three years. So we start seeing positive responses in in the soil data, and so it is a, a it is a tool that you have. Um, I mean, if you wanted to apply all the potassium via via the leaves, it wouldn't be wise because it's costly. But essentially, we we look at something like that. But now, when it comes to the the biology, if you're not measuring the biological analysis, uh, or you're not using some sort of biological or soil biological test, uh, you don't really know whether that soil's limiting factor is biology. So in the past, um, my colleague Hanu was doing this in a, in a farm, a client of ours up in the Orange River. They were farming in the, in basically what we saw the alluvial beds of the of the Orange River in in an area called Blow Pit. So it's quite a challenging environment. It's very hot. Um, you know the river runs through it. It's uh, it's uh, fifty degrees plus in summer, so the soils get really baked. But they had citrus orchard there, and um, man, we threw everything we had at it. We threw. Fertilizers. We threw um, humic acids. We did all kinds of soil flocculation, and after about um, after about uh, a year of this or six months of it, the farmer said, "Man, you can see our products dripping out the bottom of his farm. It's, he's applied so much of it." And 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 I said to my colleague, "Well, listen, I, we we don't have time for a test now, but let's just. I feel this could be biology." And and we applied 20 liters of like a probiotic that we produce, and oh yes, the farm just exploded within you know within a month. It was totally different ball game. So so the, the the tree showed us that biology was limiting, and that's really where we started to say, well, listen, we've got to be able to quantify and help a grower so that we don't waste his money, but it also gives us a, a structured approach on how to manage the biology. We won't always get it right because. You know, Mother Nature comes now like in September, October, last year, August, September. I remember all the bloody rain we had here. It's incredible. I mean, we've got um, apple and, 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 and pear farmers in Felizdor, uh across the mountain here that had so much rain. I mean, everything was washed out of the soil. The potash, the organics, the microbes, everything was fly, flushed down the river. So, so you've got to start back from base one. But, you know, you have a weather incident like that, it, it does affect the... Um, uh, it, it does affect the biology in the soil. Certainly, your um, your limiting factors will will show up, and and I'll, I refer to them as Achilles' heels. It's our job as, as as agronomists and trying to help growers to identify where these Achilles' heels are. So, we have soil boosters, we have soil priming, 
we have all kinds of um, uh, soil health management uh, inputs, but we need a tool to measure it. And that's that's a little bit of a different angle that we have on it. We'd rather have a farmer spend, um, you know, if you divided it up over a five-year period, 100, 200 rand per hectare per year amortized into his budget for analyses. He might not do it that year. He might not do it every other year, but at least he's got it in his budget because that data is, is incredibly important to make sure we can qualify and quantify how much and if we need it. Elaine Ingham has made this concept of the soil food web yeah. sort of brought it into popular agricultural uh, culture. You know, it's very simply depicted a, a fairly complicated situation um, to make it uh, simple for us, but it, it's more it's more complicated than a food chain, uh, but it's still uh, drawn a lot more simply than that. And the way I understand it is that the various trophic levels along there is you know, your biology can be right to get one part started, but things eventually run out um, and you run out of out of food for the web to continue to function properly. And uh, you, 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 you reach levels where, where it stops functioning. Is that, is that a correct uh, analysis? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I remember when I was doing um, uh, a little bit of a course on, well, a little bit of a course, the subject I had to study was, was, uh, Plant, uh, you know, plant physiology or plant biochemistry. They had this wonderful Excel spreadsheet that would say, well, what stages happen in cellular division, and and you would guess on on a block, and it would just say wrong, you can't divide, wrong, you can't divide, wrong, you can't divide, and right at the top there was a one block that said glucose, and you had to go fifty kilojoules of glucose, then you could do the first stage, and so as you added on the Excel spreadsheet, it calculated. And you could then clearly see you needed energy to divide the cell. So for one to become two and two to become four, you needed energy. So you and I are the same. Uh, we need to ingest food. We need to breathe air. And we need to take water in to keep our engine going. And that mitochondrial engine that runs in us runs in bacteria. It runs in plants. Um, and it's uh, it's a very important little energy cell. So... Inside the plant, inside an organism, we have energy requirements. Bacteria are, 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 are different and fungi in that they can get hold of, of dead or decaying or um, non-living tissue and exude enzymes. Uh, and these enzymes have the ability to break down and what we call then start organic nutrient recycling. The, 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 you know, the starting up of that, that organic um that organic cycle in the soil of the carbon, the nitrogen, first the water, the carbon, the nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, sulfur cycles. So when you when you talk about uh, uh, um, uh, you know tweaking the soil and, and getting it going, if there isn't food for it, you can add microbes to the soil. We've seen that now. My colleague Vili Pretoria at Ward Laboratories. We work with him uh, in the U.S. Uh, he was he talks about burning down the house. Um, the microbes, uh, you, you dump a whole lot of microbes in the ground. I've done it also to, to clients because we're chasing a yield. Um, but if you know what it does to the soil, you can at least implement a strategy to overcome that problem in, in the shortfall and long long term. Is it might consume all of the, the, the carbon and the excess sugars that are deposited by the plant? And there's no buildup of organic matter in the soil because these oxygen-loving bacteria just consume it all. So you, you need to find... Um, a happy stasis in where your inputs of energy into the soil and the rate at which the microbes are growing is all in balance. And that's what we try and do with these trophic levels. You need millions of bacteria to support the one above it and the one above it and the one above it. So each step up, you will eventually uh, reduce in the number of organisms, but they will obviously become bigger. So eventually, right at the top of the of, of an ecosystem, you might find us or in a given natural environment, birds uh, or an animal that's grazing on grass, for argument's sake. So right out of each trophic level, it builds up out of the ground. So what we're doing is we're trying to establish, is there a broken trophic level or is this trophic level much reduced? And if it is reduced, why? And we quickly correlate that to um, available food sources. So plants should be putting it into the soil, but if the farmer doesn't have a diverse crop, a cover crop or diversity in his area and uh, and he's farming that way and that's his way or their way of doing it. Like we've seen citrus farmers. It's difficult for us to grow something on the ridge uh, on a citrus crop because of the shallow root system it has and the um, 
nutrient competition it has with the uh, the cover crop. So we we inevitably only farm a cover crop in between the orchards, and we try and make sure that we we put organic amendments and some residues uh, at a certain time of the year to compost and break down on the ridge. N nothing growing there. So th that is that is one method that we've we've implemented to to make sure that we can have these organic food sources going into the soil to drive the microbes. I mean, if, if you feed them just one type of food source, like if you fed them just sugar, you, you're going to only accelerate the ones that grow faster than the ones that don't grow as fast. So you end up with a less diverse environment. So putting, you know, I wish every farmer could compost any residue he has in his farm. It's just like, it would be a no-brainer for me, especially uh, vegetable farmers we know must do it. But if we look at uh, uh, fruit farmers, all of the other guys, at least once every three to five years, you you say, I've got 100 hectares of farm. I'm going to divide it up and I want to do 20 hectares a year. Uh, so every five years, you're coming back with this dump of, of good quality compost. And at least you brought diversity back into your, um, from a microbial, from a production point of view, we do that. But if you can get a cover crop in and it can be diverse and multi-way, you're going to inherently foster that environment that those microbes want to colonize that root of that plant and and stay in the soil and yes their populations will go up and down and that's driven by wetting and drying cycles it's driven by temperature you know 12 degrees we call as the the biological level at which we see very little activity and then as the soil starts to warm up things become more and more and as they get more active they then consume nutrients in the environment grow divide grow divide when their food source runs out they get eaten when those animals die or those organisms die, they release nutrients back into the environment. And so the cycle starts again. And if, if, if you have that basic cycle interrupted, you can't build any of the trophic levels above it. Oh. So the bottom of the pyramid, I wasn't around there when they built them in Egypt, but if you've ever been there, they're still standing. And I reckon it's because the base hasn't eroded with this. There's crumbling at the top, but the base hasn't gone yet. Yeah. And typically... Would you recommend if farmers are having that problem there, it, it really is, it's about feeding the system, okay, so that you don't burn down the house. Uh, you've got to put more food in to to feed both the plant and the soil, both the, the bugs in the soil and the plant. And sometimes you hear people saying, oh, you should you should feed the plant, and other people say you should feed the bugs. Can you shed some light on 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 that? I, I, re I reckon some people make that statement based on the type of farming practice or the type of farm, sorry. So if you have a really intensive, um, if you have an intensive fruit production facility um, where you need to get good yields off to, to, to financially make sense, you know, for sustainability, and you know this is an issue, then you have to apply uh, some things to the soil immediately to feed the microbes. Mm. Essentially, if you grew that, prop, that crop very well, uh, it would rise deposit a lot of nutrients in the soil. Um, it varies from plant to plant, but I know that some plants pump out between 50 and sometimes even 60% of all of the, the sugar they produce in photosynthesis, their photosynthate, they actually exude at the roots. And they push that out to feed the organisms that are colonizing around the root. And those are about its interactions with improving availability of nutrients, disease control. Um, oh, there's multiple aspects. But in the bulk soil, You've still got these basic primary degraders of the organic uh, nutrient recycling and and roots want to grow where there's oxygen and where there's food so those roots will inevitably want to go into a soil environment where the ph is similar there's not little compaction and the roots grow aggressively in that environment the more volume of roots you have colonizing the root the the soil the bigger surface area you have contact with the greater the nutrient uptake the better the yield so some people try and drive uh, uh, we do as well. Sometimes we drive it by treating the plant to accelerate growth so that we can get more roots quicker. And we also work on the soil. If you only chose the plant, uh, you know, you fed the plant to feed the soil scenario, it can be done, but it's it's probably going to be quite costly in my opinion. Uh, you know, I do believe that soil was there for a reason. And if we can work on it um, and change it, uh, uh, and the plant stands in the soil, we've got to get it right eventually. But I mean, if, if you took me now, and I, I grew green beans for, for a big retail outlet uh, many years ago, and I mean, I realized I, I would put poultry manure down, and I would put some super phosphate fertilizer down, and I'd plant my green beans, and I was planting like two hectares a week. And I realized afterwards, I mean, I, 
I would foliar feed all the potassium. I'd foliar feed most of the micronutrients, but a green bean with its leaf reacts so beautifully to that. I would just get the most wonderful crop and yield off with a minimal input um, of, of fertilizers. But uh, um, when I added up my um, my cost of this excessive foliar fertilizing, I realized, well, let me just take in, uh, some of the other nutrients and let's apply them at the soil. So I reduced my inputs on my farm by splitting the, the, the load. So even though the crop reacts well to that treatment, uh, it still made sense putting some in the soil. Um, and 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 when I did that, I got even you know more one or two more picks out of the out of the beans. They didn't. What I was experiencing is I'd get one or two harvests off, but the third, fourth harvest, which I should have got off, uh, was uh, it didn't justify putting workers through the land. So I, I started to uh, implement uh, applying a little bit more to the soil and less foliar, and um, boom, the I got four picks. So I've proved it to myself uh, that that certainly a strategy um, can be implemented like that, but it, it could be costly. Yeah, I, I would I would think. Okay, okay, Gav. Once again, we're running out of time. So last uh, question: the the emergence of biological soil tests uh, recently mm -hmm. um, as something that farmers now have available to them. Can you just give a, a, a brief overview on that um, and? Uh, and, and what, what you recommend and, and what they should be looking for. Tell us about biological sure. soil tests. So what, um, you know, what we started to do in the beginning when we were working with the chemical soil tests is, is we, we, were, we were saying, well, look, let's look at the cost of this fertilizer. And the most expensive fertilizer per kilogram is phosphate. And, and the world has gone past 50% of the world's reserves of phosphorus. So we're in a period of less and less available phosphate um so so we need to conserve what we have and build the availability thereof so we started to look at tests uh, and and it, and it caused a whole group of agronomists to go offshore uh, overseas and 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 look at different types of, of testing which is now done standard yeah in a lot of our laboratories so we can get it done locally um and and that made us look differently at phosphorus availability so much so that we either were under fertilizing it or now we could uh, reduce the input of phosphate and that 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 was a big big change for us. What we we weren't looking at was was the, the biology. We were measuring just the availability of a nutrient, but because of biology. So now we're actually measuring the biology, and that's that's slightly different. So one of the the gentlemen that that revolutionised this, and I, I inspire anyone to listen to a talk of his. Uh, I know he's left the USDA and he's now in the commercial environment, but there's a guy called Dr. Rick Haney. I think you might have heard of him. And uh, he's developed a, a very pragmatic approach to the soil testing. But what it did do is it opened everyone's eyes around. Um, there was actually a, 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 a Woods, Woods End Laboratory is, is probably a pioneer on the soil. If I remember correctly, in the 70s already, they were doing soil respiration tests. But it would take over 90 days to get a correlation, you know, a, a test. It was just too long. And with that, we've refined that process down to a 48-hour cycle where our correlation is very high over the 90 days to what we test and evaluate in, in 48. But in his testing, he realized that actually we talk about a carbon-nitrogen ratio in the environment. So we go and analyze all the carbon in the soil, and we analyze all the available nitrogen, and we say that this is the carbon-nitrogen ratio. But the organisms don't see that. They can only access, and specifically like bacteria, they can only access what water-soluble carbon there is, and that can be in the form of sugars and, and, and multiple different types of organic acids or the water-soluble nitrogen. And that's the true carbon-nitrogen ratio. So we were getting, uh, for the microbes, I mean, and that was what was happening, is we were getting soils with a test uh, carbon level of 1.5%, and we were getting ones of 6%. And and Haney showed with the respiration test, the one with 1.5% had a way higher carbon uh, um, uh, CO2 respiration, meaning the biological activity was way higher. There was more food for them there, even though the soil had 5% less carbon. And, and, and that has to do, the stage of that carbon had already degraded to the point that we had a, a large labile active fraction of what we call microbially active carbon. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to test uh, in, in these tests. And we're doing those now. So uh, facilities that can test water extractable organic carbon, there's way we wanted to, to around, but uh, uh, having to understand uh, how that, uh, that test is done properly. Um, we've we've connected with a couple of laboratories and we work with, as I said, we work with ward laboratories. Brookside do one as well. Um, also a phenomenally good laboratory. 
uh, Woods End do one, Cornell University does, uh, they all have a method of looking at the overall biological uh, complexity of the soil. Uh, another test needs to be done, which which those laboratories, I don't think every one of them offers the offers the further complexity test, but the Soil Health Institute in the USA have, have drawn up what they call a tier one and a tier two. Um, and, and we as a as a group here in SA follow that that guideline. We we try and use it as a as a guideline only. Um, look, we've got local labs, uh, we've got local laboratories. Uh, I'll name I'll mention them. I mean Envirotech, SGS, uh, BEM Lab, uh, LabServe. Um I, I sorry if I forget anyone out there, but I mean we've used multiple of these labs. And all of them uh, provide Envirotech uh, labs. They all provide incredibly good analyses. But around this biological respiration and, and the analyses that we require and the interpretation of the information, we just probably don't have enough depth here. But there's, there's other companies locally that are doing certain, all different types of biological tests. And, uh, and I do believe that with time, we will evolve and, and become more uh, the laboratory become more commercially orientated that we can offer the service at a at a better price locally and um and yeah it, it, i'm sure it'll come with time um but at this stage we we utilize a lot of offshore testing and those biological tests and you are are important to to make sure that we we, we advise the farmer in what direction he's going because he's limiting factors he quite rightly said could be mineralogy and not biology and and if we haven't tested for for either we don't know then we could end up you know, making friends or, or enemies out of friends, uh, you know, by costing them money and not getting a good yield. So so the data is important to us, but the local labs will, will I believe, will, co will come with time, we'll get there. The latest round of things is genomics. And that's, uh, there's a couple of companies around the world that are doing it. And that's the real, that gets me super excited of not only identifying the trophic levels, but actually with the name and number. Because if we, we do a test now, Andrew, 50% of the microbes in the soil, we call them undifferentiated biomass. We actually don't know what they are. <laughs> so we know what some of them are, but a large portion of them are, are new to us. So the, the 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 whole field of genomics or omics, as we call it, metabolomics, proteomics, all of those things will open up, uh, I think, uh, will revolutionize the way we look at fertilization uh, and crop management and soil management in the next uh, decade. Great. Well, thanks once again, Kevin, for a fascinating talk, um, ranging subjects, and uh, I'm sure even uh, some science people learned a bunch of science there. Oh, um, no, I don't know about that. There's, there's some very <laughs> clever people, much cleverer than you and me out there. Oh, yeah, but, uh, much clearer, the, but, farmers, uh, the farmers, Andrew, us, I tell you, the farmers at the end of the day are the real laboratory, eh? uh, yeah. and each lab is different, so so one has to always arrive, I always arrive at a farm and I, I dig deep in my faith and I, I, I try and get myself as humble as possible to say, I know nothing and let me just observe as much as possible. But yeah, you tend to 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 run away uh, yeah. when, when you start looking at the soil because it's complex. It's not easy. Thank you. And um, I look yeah. forward to, to other chats. Yeah, next chat. Yeah, we must think up something. If the, the viewers have got any any suggestions, I must please ping Region Ag and and, and give us a, a suggested idea of what we can uh, research and, and come back to you about uh, experiences and, and other people's experiences out there. Brilliant. Cheers, Gav. Thank you, Andrew. Have a good week. Cheers. You too.